start the screen share. Give me one okay. uh, please let me know when you can see this. Yes, I can see it. Okay, great. All right. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. Thanks for taking out your time on your precious Wednesday evening of this, um, of this fine London morning evening. Um, my name is Apoor Kashyap, and I work for a company called Sintasa. I am here with my colleague, um, Charmi Patel. Um, I'll let her introduce herself in a minute. Um, we thanks Hendrik for having us on this on this FinML fourth session. Um, really exciting, uh, uh, really exciting times. Uh, we wanted to talk uh, about digital behavioral data and share some uh, experiences we've had. Um, uh, with Sintasa in our and in our past lives, um, Charmi and I both are practitioners in digital data and analytics, machine learning for the past 20 years or so. So we have a lot of insights and 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 things that we've learned in this course in in our experience. And uh, yeah, today we just thought we would bring together some of these key insights and 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 uh, trends that have been evolving in the industry. Um, lately, because of COVID, that has also accelerated a lot, lot more, as you probably hear every every time anyone does a presentation. Um, that's actually, you know, the, the 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 biggest driving factor at this point. People are engaging with each other using digital platforms. People are engaging with your services and your businesses using your websites and your apps. So, understanding what people, you know, what your customers and what your prospects are doing. You know, the, the only way to do, understand what their intent is, is to look at that digital behavioral data um, and to look at it from um, an angle of how the interactions have gone. So that data is very large, hence the use of ML A and AI is obviously, you know, the, the, the most obvious thing. It's nothing new. It's been going on for, you know, five, six years now, a um, lot longer than that you know, uh, in, in certain areas. So what we wanted to do today was to bring together some use cases and some background on what this data is and how this is useful and, uh, and, and just share with, with this group. Um, so if that's of interest, hang around. We're not gonna take a lot of slides. Um, it's just five or six slides and then we'll open it up for, for a free form discussion and, and just, you know, talk about things that may be on your mind. Um, so if that's okay, Charmi, please uh, go ahead and introduce yourself and then we can get started. Sure. Um, hi, everybody. This is Charmi. Um, I head the data and uh, AI operations at Sintasa and most of the use cases um, or the uses that we're going to see here, uh, I have been part of building those um, and now have a pretty large team um, that oversees the development of all of those use cases. Awesome, thank you. All right, so moving on to the first slide of the deck, um, if I can move, yeah, okay. All right, so I thought it was, I, I thought, you know, thanks for Tide and Hendrik for having us here. So I thought it'd be nice to look at a customer journey. Um, I am actually a Tide Bank customer. Um, so I took one journey that I have taken recently, um, a digital, obviously a digital journey of opening an account uh, that was some time ago. And I thought I'll walk through that journey and talk about you know, how, what kind of data points are getting generated, um, what is it that we call digital behavioral data, and then uh, evolve on that and, and talk a little bit more about why it's different and why it's important and, and why it's uh, really a gold mine of information. So, um, on the top, you're seeing these five or six steps, um, small screenshots, don't worry, we'll go through each one of these screenshots in, in a little bit more detail. Um, but small screenshots are showing the journey I've taken, which is basically finding Tide Bank on Google search, going to the Tide's website, clicking on opening an account, and then opening an account, and following through that process, and then finally getting an email saying, you know, it's, it's, it's done, it's complete. Um, and then confirming the steps and so on. That's the overall journey I'm gonna talk about. And then obviously the start point of this journey in my case was searching on Google. Um, 
as we do with a lot of the services out there, you know, we need to find it somehow and we often use the search engines. Um, with the search engines, obviously the businesses that are providing services would want to show their results on the top. Um, they want to show uh, either the ads or you know, prioritize their search result on the top so that the sooner the customer sees their name, the, the quicker it's, you know, the more likely the customer will um, go to their digital service. So in this case, Tide marketing team obviously had set up a Google search ad um, campaign which included some sort of a configuration, billing period, budget, so on. So imagine, right, we're, we're talking all about data. So I'm talking in terms of like all the different data points that are getting captured. So bear with, bear with me on that, keep that in mind. So on this search screen, there's some search setup that was done. It created a bunch of data points, not with Tide, but within Google search. When I make that search on Google, um, Google decides to show a bunch of things to me based on my Chrome ID, my Google client ID, uh, the search term itself. And if I interact with some of the reviews and if I interact with some of the links, Google is taking care of all of that, right? It's looking at all of that holistically and then showing me the right results, what it thinks is the right thing for me to see. Um, so outcome of that, I find the tied business current account, which is the top link, great job. You know, I click on that and I land on the home page for Tide.co. Tide um, if you could zoom in into this um, home page, the URL, you will realize that it's not just Tide.co. It has a bunch of parameters that got passed to it by Google. And it's done for a specific purpose. A, because Google wants to attribute that, hey, I sent a new customer to your website, right? That's how Google is saying I'm creating value for you. Um, but B, also it's providing those um, data points back to Tide or to any other digital provider um, to give them the information how, what campaign brought the person to their website and, and you know, what was the source. So there's like five or six different data points that are usually called urchin. In Google's term, it's called urchin parameters, um, like source, medium, campaign, content, and so on. So on the right-hand side of the, of the screenshot, I have that uh, timeline where I'm showing that first I've made the search on Google and then I've landed on this website. So far, so good. You know, not a lot of data. As you can imagine, there's a few data points, a few rows of data somewhere in Google's billing system where, you know, the search has been set up. There's a few couple of data points that have, we have captured from the home page. But this is where really the magic happens. This is where the data explodes. So now, as intended, if I were to click on the open an account, what really happens is that that's my you know, first or second click stream event. That's when I have clicked on the digital service and there's a whole bunch of scripts and analytics and tagging and all of that that's happening on the website for each one of these digital providers, Tide, Tide obviously being one of them. But for any service provider, those kind of tags and scripts will fire in the background and create a monumental amount of data just for a single click. Uh, that's what we typically call clickstream, clickstream data. As, as the name suggests, it's the click and the stream of those clicks is going to produce that clickstream data. Um, clickstream data alongside all the other digital behavioral data like interacting with Google ads or Facebook and so on, all together can be called like behavioral data because that's how I have behaved and found certain service. So the clickstream data for each one of those clicks could easily have like visitor, session, JavaScript, campaign, click, URLs, cookies, on and on. There's around a thousand data points that single click has produced. Um, and that is available for your businesses, for Tide, to actually then look at and, and do analytics and, and improve their business. So imagine 10 years ago, if I was to walk into a Barclays branch, uh, you know, I would still have a, you know, I would have a bread come behind me, right? I would have a trail, a footprint. Um, I would talk to the bank manager. I would go to the ATM. I would go to the teller. I would do something. But all of that data was never getting captured, right? I mean, barely any data was getting captured, which was like the transaction data. Like if I withdraw cash, yes, that will be in some, some kind of transaction ledger 
but all the other things I've looked at, all the pamphlets I've looked at, all the things I've done in the branch, that data, imagine that data now in digital world is getting captured. All of that data is getting captured in this clickstream. So as you can now start to you know, see that with every click I'm going to make, uh, by the way, I have a little screenshot of you know, some of the key fields that show up in this data. And what we're going to do is I'm soon going to hand it over to Charmi and Charmi can talk a few uh, about like how to use machine learning on this data. Um, but I'm just walking through how this data is getting generated. So as I progress through this application, as you can see in the timeline, I'm creating clickstream events after event. This is just me, right? There are 10,000 people opening an account or more, right? Every year, every month, all of us who do this, take this journey, we take it in a slightly different way. Some people click on FAQs first and then go back to opening an account. Some people may click on, you know, what app store is supported for this bank. You know, some may, someone may click on uh, customer support, someone may click on something else. All of that is still part of that journey before they opened an account. And it's really important to capture all of this data, which by the way, is already getting captured on your website. Um, that is all that's collected together is called behavioral data. Now, one last thing to add here um, is alongside Clickstream, that's your data that's on your website, on Tide's website, all the tags that are fighting. But also on the websites, there are external third-party providers or second-party providers who are who could be your partners like Facebook, right? Um, on, on a news website, Facebook could be their partner and Facebook may have a tag on, on Telegraph's website, for example. Um, so all the partners that you have on, on Tide's website, there's around like 40 partners. Imagine all of this clickstream data that is getting generated on Tide's website is also getting generated on each of these 40 different providers. For most part, all of this data is available for Tide to use because it's obviously being generated on their website. Um, but as you can start to get the picture, this is humongous amounts of data. This typically is like hundreds, if not like thousands of times of what you would have in your enterprise system. Imagine this entire journey I've taken, I've made one enterprise data entry, right? Or maybe five. You know, I may have made an entry in your enterprise system saying name and contact, some document verification, some KYC on onboarding. But, you know, those are still single rows and some enterprise system. As compared to the clickstream data where I've created thousands of data points across maybe 10 clicks. Um, and that's really the point, um, is that your customers are, be, are engaging with you digitally and you have the trail of exactly what everyone has done on your website. And this is, this is all legit, right? This is nothing to do with GDPR or anything like that. This is your data, you have captured it. And how do you want to use this is what we want to get into now as the second part of our presentation. Um, I know we, we said we won't have any questions, but if there's any burning question at this point, feel free to, feel free to raise a hand or something um, and we'll try to answer it. But hopefully we'll, we'll you know, cover a lot of questions in the next 30 minutes. Um, so moving on from how we've captured the data and all the data sets that are actually involved in what we are calling digital behavioral data, um, we have had the absolute pleasure of working across all sorts of digital companies. It could be an e-retailer, it could be someone selling electronics or selling financial services, it could be someone providing customer care. Uh, there's, there's a plethora of use cases that we have been fortunate enough to you know, bring this data into and then provide a lot of uplift, a um, lot of value. Um, I think it'll be uh, good for Charmi to, um, you know, if you want to jump in now and maybe talk about the fraud use case. Uh, we were thinking we'll talk about fraud and retargeting, um, but then we can cover some more use cases during the questions. Um, but I'll, ju I'll just leave the slide in the background so that if you want, you can have a look. But Charmi, please. Um. Sure. So um, 
I think the first thing that happens when you start looking at the amount of digital data that is being collected, typically when you, if you're not coming from the um, web analytics ecosystem, it's, it's hard to comprehend the amount of data that is being collected and the richness that that data offers. But once you kind of get used to it, um, then like AK was saying, there's so many different places that you can start utilizing it that it's, it's really, uh, mind boggling. And uh, like he said, we have practically utilized this data to, to support on many different use cases. Um, but one thing that has been really helpful for us to do, uh, especially when we're looking at uh, utilizing this data from a predictions perspective, is um, because this is so rich data, uh, we uh, generating predictions kind of becomes uh, almost a catch up because there's constantly new data that is uh, coming in. And um, after experimenting with very many different ways of doing our data preparation, the first thing that we really found that worked very well for us was to convert every single problem that we have to do into so um, every single prediction problem into two parts. One is to define some sort of a look back window. Um, so define a window for which we're going to look at user's activity. Um, and then uh, for that activity, then we go ahead and look forward to see had that person done a particular action. And um, there's some nuances here. Sometimes we end up seeing a person coming back to the website multiple times. And what do we do? Um, we actually end up counting both of those visits as separate visits and we learn from those. We know that we are now able to, by doing this kind of streaming thing, we're able to see early indicators of somebody converting seven, down, seven days um, uh, down the road, for instance. And, um, it, and, and what, it also helps once we come up with a framework of how we're going to do our data preparation and our data transformations, which is typically in the look back and look ahead kind of a way, then it becomes very simple for us as a data uh, engineering organization and data science organization to, to have the same common terminology across everybody. Um, and what we have found once we picked and on, on that particular mechanism. The first thing was that no matter what kind of use case, no matter what kind of customer we picked, um, interestingly, seven days of user activity on the site was a very good predictor of what they were going to do in the next seven days. Um, and, uh, unless you're like, you know, unless you're making like several thousand dollar or pounds worth of trans, uh, transactions, Typically seven days, even buying a laptop, for instance, seven days, or sometimes you can go to 14 days, but that, that is essentially enough to understand where somebody stands. Um, and uh, we have seen this across um, many, many different uh, types of uh, data usage now. It's not just one kind of a customer who's just doing grocery. Uh, who is in just grocery business, but e-commerce of various types, or even some sort of uh, uh, financial products that people have been looking at. Seven days seems to be somewhat of an interesting cutoff point where beyond that, we just don't see enough lift in, in our models. The benefit of doing that actually is that now that we're looking at a seven day look back, um, it makes it very easy for us to take just one month worth of data, have a seven day look back. So we have two week of um, training period, two week evaluation period, and that allows us to actually build our models very close to the reality. And then um, this method allows us to continuously uh, keep on evaluating our models. The second aspect is more on the feature generation side. And again, um, you don't really typically observe this in your enterprise sources, but on um, the digital interaction channels, um, this is where it is very prominent. It's like, you know, th there's this human drive to look at something, think about it, come back, look at something, and um, then kind of move forward with your decision. 
And this is like a telltale sign. And um, uh, we've been able to tap into that to come up with various kinds of features. Are people repeatedly removing things from, um, from the basket? Um, or are people repeatedly looking at the warranty information? Uh, or they're looking at support information. All of those end up becoming very, very useful indicators in any kind of model that you're trying to build. And, um, and, and, and the place where it's really helpful is fraud. Um, interestingly, people who commit fraud are very few uh, and they do end up um, attempting fraud multiple times. And so they kind of have some sort of a pattern of how they're navigating through the website. And so they're coming from the same area or they're coming at it, um, they're, they're approaching the, uh, the navigation of the website in fairly identical ways. Um, and, and so, I mean, every, obviously every, every company's um, website is slightly different and the people, the way people interact is different for that website. But by looking at um, some of these uh, cyclical nature and coming up with features of that, um, we've, we've, we've found that to be very helpful in building out quite a few models that we needed to uh, do. Um, the fraud um, is like that. Retargeting is another one um, where retargeting is more on the um, purchase prediction side. So we're kind of trying to understand which people are more likely to make a purchase or more likely to convert. And then uh, once we know that, then we can uh, try to find ways to approach them on various channels if they're not on the website which I think we can kind of move on to the next slide because that kind of flows nicely into it. So, um, so the first part was how to derive signals and how can we really use this data in building models. But the second part is more along the lines of um, how can you really get the most out of your models? Now, what happens today is um, there's a lot of attention even in the web analytics community and the digital community where people would make sure they've tagged their website, they've tagged their uh, app, uh, they're getting that data in, but there's almost a different uh, side to it. When you start doing any kind of advanced analytics or machine learning, what you wanna do is make sure that your you, your serving ecosystem, the digital ecosystem is connected with your ML layer. Um, and, um, and by doing that, you're now able to activate your models on so many channels. You can have the same model kind of serve up um, something on your email system. You can have the same model serve something on the advertising side. You can have the same one interacting on your on-site. So, as an example that I put up here, let's let's take a simple example here. There's a propensity to open an account on the, the website that a, um, a Purusha just showed us earlier. It's one model, just one simple model. But if we really, and, and let's say we have, this is a good model and we want to maximize the return we get out of this model. It's not really about even optimizing your model even further to get another 1% accuracy improvement in it. It's really more from business perspective. It ends up being that, what can I do with this model? So there are four examples here. Uh, the first one is uh, like, you know, if you find somebody's a high propensity to open the account, but you can see the signals of hesitancy you can pop up an on-site chat. You, most of the companies already have a chat system embedded. Um, the other one is if they leave, you can, if they, if they were in high propensity segment, you can interact with your digital advertising side and uh, make sure that you're able to offer the right kind of ads to that particular person. If let's say there is the, per the person is, on the low propensity side, and they're still lingering around on the website. And you just want to try what, what can I do to perhaps increase the propensity? Well, maybe you can off, uh, offer some sort of a discount um, or some sort of an offer that you have running. Uh, typically, most companies have some offers or some campaigns that are running all, all the time. They sometimes do that randomly. 
um, instead do it in a data driven manner. Um, and like, you know, the last one is if somebody again was in your high propensity bucket and they've left, but now they're searching something on Google, well, Google allows you to bid on uh, search keywords. You can place those people in those appropriate segments and a bid higher for those people because you know they're likely to convert. If they come back the next time around, they will most likely convert. So again, we're not really trying to optimize the model yet at this point. We're just taking the same model and trying to maximize the business benefit of it across all of the different activation endpoints. Um, and, and doing that, just by doing that, now imagine if you have five models or 10 models and you have like five or 10 activation endpoints, you really have so much business value that can come out of it. So um, I think we're going to be a short on time or at least we're at our half hour point. So I will actually stop here, but sort of just retrade back to through what a, uh, Apur started with, which is that as people are navigating through your website, your email systems, your, I mean, your email newsletters, your apps, there's a digital trail that is being left behind. And um, there's, uh, it, is, it is your property. This data has been collected on your behalf in several SaaS systems already. Being able to tap into those, being able to bring that into your system use that in your modeling and then connecting back with all of the activation endpoints or the digital systems where people actually interact with you as a company um, is, is a very um, important thing to uh, do to get more and more ML embedded into the uh, like, you know, people's digital experience with, uh, with overall all of your properties. Yeah. Thanks, cool. Thanks a lot. I thought it was really interesting. Um, some, uh, yeah. So please um, already put your questions in the chat so that we can um, we can raise them uh, directly uh, to these two as well. Um, so just to, to summarize, so my understanding is um, the, the thing that you are proposing is really to have like, um, different attributes of customers, such as like, do they have high propensity and then their situation and from there mapping the, the actions on top uh, as well. And that would be another focus that you currently have, is that correct? Yes, that's right. I mean, ultimately it goes back to the same concepts that have been floating around for a couple of decades now, next best action and you know what's the propensity to take certain action what is the affinity towards certain brands, certain products, certain types, certain categories, having these available uh, using obviously your machine learning models. Uh, but these models, instead of training just on enterprise data, which is like one data point every two months, it trains mm -hmm. on digital data, which is you know thousands of data points per minute. Um, and it is a game changer because there's like so much you know, there's typically there's three to five times uplift, even by just doing what Charlie was explaining, you know, just having models activate and A-B tested on the activation endpoints. Um, but if you if you really spend time and you tune it, uh, we've seen 10 times uplift on some, sometimes even 97% uplift. You know, our customers have cut their advertising cost. Sometimes they've been able to create like millions of dollars of revenue uplift by just doing these basic things. Um, so, yeah, you really have to stop us talking because we are just like so excited. We don't want to stop talking. So yeah. give us we some a question. <laughs> we do have a question from the audience now. Um, okay. Paul, do you want to, to raise your question? Uh, sure. I, uh, and if this is if you can say, I'm just curious on the fraud side, do you, um, how do you uh, sort of uh, decide on that? Is it like association rules, graph database? If you can say, I'm just curious how you do that under the hood. So um, on the enterprise side, what happens from a fraud perspective is, uh, well, I, I have more experience on the retail fraud. So um, 
when there is somebody who buys something um, and turns out that this was a fraudulent transaction, typically the bank would, um, if somebody notices that this was a wrong charge on their credit card, they would call up their bank, the bank will give them their money back and then bank will go back to the retailer and take the money back from the retailer. So the retailer actually knows that this was some sort of a chargeback. That's the common terminology in the, in, on the fraud side. So now the retailer is receiving a delayed signal that somebody uh, made a fraudulent purchase. And what happens at that point is the retailer has already provided services and, in lieu of the payment. And, um, and so they're, they're on the wrong, like they lose money, they lose the, um, they, they lost the money and they also provided the services. So they've, they've kind of in a double, um, uh, double loss scenario. Um, sorry, I'm probably not answering your question on the right track. So, um, so it ends up being more of a classification problem to start with. Um, most of the companies do have certain idea of their chargeback rates and um, then it becomes sort of an optimization problem of trying a whole lot of different things to find the right kinds of uh, transactions to avoid. Um, so we found classification models typically work very well. It's very imbalanced, uh, however, because fraud rate is very low, but um, it's still classification. Thank you. And I also want to compliment you on a wonderful presentation. Very clear. Uh, just want to make sure I got that out. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Paul. you. Thanks, Paul. Um, Edgar, I think you are the next two to ask a question. Uh, hi. Uh, well, uh, first, uh, I have to thank you for the presentation. It's, it's really interesting. I think it's a very hot topic uh, to talk about behavioral analytics and all the applications with machine learning. There are uh, quite a lot of interesting research in the area. Uh, but I, I want I want to uh, well hear your position regarding uh, how explainable this could be. Let's say, uh, could you derive uh, some of this behavior towards fraud or towards certain things and also the, the problem that we have sometimes in machine learning with the with the unconscious bias and and all these let's say uh, racist classifiers or or gender uh, these equality classifiers I, I don't know i just want to hear your thoughts also based on your experience on this so you know it yes we do hear about it what is interesting is that in some ways digital behavior is sort of uh, you know protected class agnostic because that is not allowed to be collected by the browser. So all you know is what are people navigating and how are people navigating? And so unless you really tried very hard to find somebody's gender or race, you really don't see it. Uh, all you see is what are people, how are people actually interacting with your website, with your app and trying to make a prediction off of that. So. Um, so it ends up being a little easier to avoid those kinds of problems. Obviously, if you're going to get access to your enterprise data and start adding it in there, that is a different thing. But I mean, that happens and it comes up sometimes. Um, as, as somebody on the data practice side, you know, you just have to make a call that you're going to use that data or not use that data. It's, it's not that Unfortunately, it's not like, you know, a set uh, line that you can uh, figure out all, always uh, how far you're going to go. If I also throw in Charmi, just, uh, you know, maybe maybe uh, you want to talk a little bit about like how we in our practice, we do the drift monitoring and like the, you know, the monitoring of the model itself. And if that could be used at places to just monitor certain kind of bias could there be bias monitoring that there could be bias monitoring if you so so yeah that is a good point so let's say um so what we do is we typically uh, this look back and look ahead thing that i had shown earlier uh what we do is when we productionize our model we actually i mean we obviously have to keep on doing our look back but because of the way we've engineered our data pipelines 
we always have our look ahead in place as well. So anytime we productionize our model, we will also productionize the rest of the evaluation. So on a daily basis, we would be evaluating if the predictions we made seven days ago are still accurate. And is that in line with the original model that we had? So if I take a step back and say, um, use what Apoor is saying, then yes, that, that framework can actually go a little bit further where you can then put segments in like race or gender and um, see if your model is somehow um, performing differently between different uh, groups uh, or population segments. Uh, thank you very much. I have tons of questions, but I let others uh, also. And, I know, um, Brenton, I haven't forgotten you, but um, Adam, I think you had a direct follow up to this. Adam? Hello. Hi, sorry. Um, yeah, just based on some research that I was doing the other day, actually. Um, so sometimes, and I, I'm not saying that this is this is the case in this situation, but you know, you might have some patterns of behaviour uh, um, in terms of the cliques that are typical of women or typical of men, and so on. Um, and you know, if your if your sort of black box model is picking up on those, then it, it's still possible to build a high, it, you know, it would still be possible to build a highly biased classifier, even in spite of not having an explicit feature for that. So an explicit gender feature. So I just wondered if you might comment on that. Yeah, you're, you're right that that is quite possible. Uh, we, um, we typically look at people's navigation patterns, um, as well as how they're interacting with different uh, form elements, um, and use all of that into our feature generation. So it is possible now. Um, there's, there's actually two two ways that I can answer this. One is that we've worked with certain customers who wanted to, let's say, um, target certain um, new product segments um, towards women. And uh, to be honest, we had a really hard time just by looking at uh, the pages people were navigating. Um, and this was more on the electronic side uh, or you know, phones um, and, um, accessories of phones. So it wasn't really that easy for us, but but we also didn't try very hard because ultimately their objective was to find the right people that were going that would be interested in the, the products they were offering. And so um, we didn't really spend too much time doing that. But you are right, this is possible. Um, what we do though is we go after optimizing the um, the target of a particular business outcome which is somebody making a purchase um, so we don't essentially try to exploit any of those race and gender related um, uh, features um, but it's it, it is quite possible but what happens is when you are in the digital ecosystem it's very hard for you to um, really understand who's who. And um, especially from a gender perspective, unless you are like Facebook where everybody logs in on a daily basis and only then they can navigate, um, you 90% of the people visiting your website are going to be anonymous people. Yeah. Well, I was also going to add, I mean, the for any good data scientist, uh, the most important purpose is to find business value. All ethics are aside. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> Sorry, it's the, other way around. it's the other way around. Yeah, it's the other way around. I always confuse that. But yeah, it's uh, it's 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 up to the person working with the data as well. I mean, a lot of lot of that responsibility falls onto your hands and how you explain to your executives and how you explain what's the right way to go about it, not just technically but ethically. Um, I think those are really important discussions and very difficult discussions sometimes. I'm um, sure we go to the next question. I think Brandon was next. Hi. Um, first of all, thank you. Really fascinating stuff. Um, so my background is risk financial services. So I'm just wondering, how do you stay on top of validation and especially regulation of ML models that are constantly relearning? 
Um, so the way we have approached this, um, first of all, it depends a little bit on the kind of model. Um, if it is a classification model, um, it is somewhat easier because you have some general metrics that you already have. Or let's say if it is a supervised model, then you've started with a model that was productionized, then you had certain um, metrics that you had already identified of, um, of defining your model, um, like you know, picking your best model, let's say you picked up F1 measure or you picked up uh, precision and recall. Um, so what we do is we, we don't stop our evaluation when the model is uh, uh, chosen. We essentially keep on evaluating our model on a cons on, on, on daily basis. And uh, when we do that, then we, we can see that our metrics are, are drifting. That makes it a little easier for us to understand um, if the model is not really performing as well. Um, it becomes more difficult in an unsupervised setting because you've kind of had data at a certain point, let's take an example of a clustering model. You come up with five clusters and if you redo the cluster and you just relearn the model, it's actually a difficult exercise, first of all, to even understand are the new clusters the same as the old clusters? Um, and if they are, then how far apart are they? Because generally they will not be statically at the same central point, for instance. So those become a little more complicated to measure. And we try to handle a distance um, and, and keep an eye on that. Um, but ultimately we, we found that um, classification models are much more easy to regulate, uh, I mean, to, to, to just keep an eye on, relearn and still know that everything's uh, totally fine. Oh, thank you. Vess, I think you're the next one. Oh, great. Hi, guys. Wait, I'll try video, but uh, my internet might break. Um, so um, thank you guys for the presentation. That was very, very clear. Um, I had one quick one, I hope. Um, so towards the end of the consumer journey that you were describing, um, where it says that, you know, a lot of the data gets, you know, transferred to the partners. Like my question was, when the partners receive the data, is it kind of a standardized set of data from all the companies that they work with? Um, or kind of what happens on their end? Because I imagine if you work with, I don't know, if you're you know, Amazon or Facebook or somebody and you like get, you know, like from the, the 1000 tides or other companies like this that you work with, you get a lot of different, you know, ways that people have labeled the data and they've actually kind of collected it. So what happens on, on that end? I hope that's actually, clear. <laughs> actually it is very standardized. So, um, so let's take an example of um, Tide. I don't know, I mean, Apur did all the research on all the tags and everything. No, Facebook, but... you can go with Facebook, yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, so, well, let me answer it my way, sorry. So when you have Tide, right? And there's uh, five different tags on it. Um, first of all, Facebook actually has a very standardized, standardized mechanism of how it is collecting the data. It gives you a tag and you drop on it. Um, you drop on your page. Now, uh, Tide itself would also have uh, some sort of data collection mechanism. Maybe it's Google Analytics, maybe it's Segment, maybe it's Adobe. Uh, the in, all of these systems also have fairly standardized way of collecting the data. Um, some of them may be delivering to your data warehouse, some of them may not be, but they are fairly standard. Um, they have their own customization options um, themselves, but from somebody who's very familiar with, um, with those systems, um, they would very easily be able to uh, make their way around this data. Yeah, usually partner data is very much structured and very much like, you know, because they're getting it from thousands of their customers. So Facebook, for example, would have a very standard tag. And in fact, it will be like pulling pulling a teeth out if you try to get some changes done with Facebook, right? Because they just would not respond, would take three months and no one would answer your email. But that's just, you know, the nature of yeah. it. Thank you. It's 
But no jab at Facebook, though. They're a great company. Oh, thank you. And um, Travolta, do you want to go next? Great. Thanks, Cedric. Thanks, Shami. That was a really interesting uh, presentation. I guess I'm, I'm someone from the enterprise side, um, used to just a few data points. So when I hear of data stream, it's kind of mind blowing and very interesting. Um, the question I had was uh, with regards to once you start to analyze this data and you see some patterns, is there something that the host or, or the firm that is capturing this data can then do something with in terms of the content, perhaps redesign it dynamically, just quite interesting in, in a kind of real life sense of what you do with this, maybe real time. Can I, yeah. can I, can I take yeah, this one, Yeah. yeah. Um, so, <laughs> so yeah, so I, I would try to highlight some of the use cases on this slide uh, uh, that I have on my screen right now, but insight and analytics is definitely like one of the most prevalent um, outcome areas of using digital data, right? Because you want to figure out, is my page optimized? Is, is, you know, look at the customer journeys and see where people are dropping off. And most companies have like standard customer journey dashboards where they can see that, okay, if someone's buying a, buying a laptop, someone's buying a car, you know, what is their journey, average journey, and where are people mostly likely to drop off and what they can do, you know, premature, you know, beforehand, what they can do to avoid drop offs and, and increase the outcomes. So yeah, insight analytics is definitely like the core of it. Um, what Charmi was talking about earlier was connecting the activation points um, directly with your models. So that would mean like connecting Google, Google ads or Facebook directly with your data model. So you identify within your digital visitors who are the ones that you want to target or retarget or send an email to and uh, you know using your models and then that's all done uh, you know automatically so that you can compare results in a much more quicker way in week by week way and say yeah this model is winning this is not winning or this one's working better in black friday times and this one works better in in non peak times uh, for example, I don't know if I've answered your question. Yeah, that's, that's really good. I, I like that, the connecting the activation points to the models. Yeah, that's, that's really helpful. Thank you. Tell me anything uh, hard? No, I think that was really uh, the crux of it. Thanks. That's the only question I can answer. So please. <laughs> um, Daniel, you raised your hand. Presumably that means you want to ask a question. Ah, uh, yes, yes. A uh, very nice presentation, by the way. I appreciate the use of more feature space. Always great to see. Uh, so one of the questions I had is a bit COVID related because uh, during COVID, a lot of people who are unfamiliar with the digital space were kind of forced to use it. You see a uptick in consumer behavior. How big of a deviation did you see compared to the start of COVID where a lot of people were forced to use this and now where people would be a bit more used to it? Do you think this has normalized over time? Um, okay, I'm answering that since I didn't jump in. So, so first of all, it definitely was a big, um, a big spike in people uh, going back to the digital channels to try to get whatever they wanted. And, um, and it wasn't, it's not just on the commercial side that we've observed this, we've seen, uh, we have, we work with many public, uh, um, age, like, you know, state governments essentially and uh, in US, um, since I'm based in US and we found the same thing that people are uh, flocking back to their uh, public services um, and looking for more and more information. And um, initially at the beginning of COVID, what happened was uh, the, the, the states themselves were not ready and even the companies in some ways, like think of this more from the enterprise side. Enterprises are suddenly trying to hunker down and understand how does this impact them? Uh, are they going to need to cut costs? Um, what is going to happen to their sales? So they themselves in some ways were really not prepared for this. Um, they had their website, which was uh, whatever it was before COVID and um, people were just coming back and looking at it. And only after a certain point, people realized that there's um, like after, 
it, it took almost a couple of weeks for people to really get the handle that there's a lot of demand for whatever services are being offered online um, and starting to experiment with that. And companies that are much more digitally uh, engaged um, and that, that have actually been doing a lot of A-B testing on their site, have been trying to personalize, they were able to really weather this a lot better than others. But in general, most of the companies we work with that have um, that have been exploiting this kind of data, they have all done very well in the last six to nine months. Yeah, just to add, just to add a little bit of a data point to that, um, uh, actually, we've seen generally thirty percent uplift uh, in like proper digital businesses that had digital and brick and mortar, you know, both sides of the business uh, before COVID, their digital businesses jumped 30% uh, on an average. I mean, it went to 200% in peak times, but on an average, it went to 30%, which is quite, you know, substantial. And their revenues increased similar to that nature, you know, 17, 20% uh, from digital. But if you think about like, is it normalizing? Um, it, that's kind of difficult question to answer because now that this is happening, companies are putting in more tags, more measures, and more you know attribution models to say you know what's going on. So it, yeah, it's hard to say you know people won't accept that. Look, now the stores are closed. That's why there's a lot of people online, or is it because people are actually enjoying online? Um, I think time would tell. I think it will take another year or so for you know proper studies to come out and say, yeah, you know, no one's going back to the store anymore, even then, when they opened after lockdown, right? Um, it's those kind of data points we're still missing. So it's hard to say if it's mobilizing. But yeah, it, the, the uptake is still there. Um, it was there just last peak period, which was November, December. Um, and it's still, you know, 30% higher than last year this time. So... Perfect. Thank you. It's going to be interesting to see what the drop off point will be, as you said, in maybe a year or so, see how much retention there is. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There don't seem to be other questions in chat. I still had a question on the more on the kind of guess, modeling side. So um, how do you actually think about like when you build the models on the, the feature side, do you like build features on the kind of um, identity level, say like what was the number of lock ins in the last like week, two weeks or so? Or do you try to model the events themselves and then try to ingest it into some kind of like sequence model, trying to, yeah, um, be, be more generic on the, the different behaviors that would be possible? So we, we, we always pick an identity. Um, in the digital world, we don't always know who that person is. So there may be uh, somebody visiting the website who is a previous customer and we may or may not really know that. Maybe they've logged in. So, um, so most of the times our identity ends up being um, either the um, cookie ID or in the event we have a known person, um, then we would um, also pick the known person and, and combine multiple cookie IDs to the known person. But usually it is at the ID level. So we would pick what our ID is. And then based off of that ID, we would then go back and um, g uh, gather all of our activity in the, um, in the look back period for those identities. Um, and typically we would put a cutoff time. So um, let's say if, our, if you're doing a purchase prediction uh, model, for instance, then um, we wouldn't really say that the purchase happened at uh, 10 a.m. today morning. So let me gather all the activity prior to 10 a.m. and then try to do a prediction. Instead, what we do is uh, we look at everybody that was present on the website today. So every single cookie ID that was present today, look at their activity history, and then we try to predict that did that cookie ID convert in future. Um, and, and that ends up giving us a slightly higher number of observation points as well, because like I said, uh, somebody may visit multiple days. So we know that um, a three day activity, for instance, uh, doesn't lead to a purchase, but a six day activity ends up leading to a purchase. And the model is able to pick that up automatically because all of those uh, for, um, features get uh, baked into our model. Mm -hmm. Cool. 
Were you, um, were you were you asking Henrik? Were you asking if the features are collated somewhere so that they can be used by other models? Was that part of your question? Like, can you create those features and store them in BQ or some feature store? Well, I think the the idea is that you can do it like two ways, right? You can say like there's a certain time point for an individual, and then we try to identify like features at that point in time for that individual. Like, what was like how often did he visit a certain site or whatever? Or you could say, okay, really the basic entity that we put into our model is an event where we say, okay, there was an event where we looked at like a particular picture, uh, sorry, a particular whatever, we clicked on a particular button or something. Um, and then you can try to put it into like, I don't know, like an LSTM or some kind of model in order to, to be generic about like customer behavior. And I don't know like what, what the right approach would be. Yeah, like. yeah. So the look back actually allows us to do that because now we have a feature at an identity level at a time a time interval and then we can reuse the same sort of features across many different uh, uh, outcome variables so if it is a classification model and we have um, one model that is going after product one model that's going after warranty one model going after credit they can all be independently learning off of the same set of features that are coming in because um, we're not tying the data preparation to the target variable. We're only keeping the data preparation to the look back itself, which is what the person did. Cool. Shall we go to the next question? A couple more, well, one more came in. Damien, do you want to go? Um, sure, uh, thank you. Uh, thanks, thank you for the uh, presentation. Uh, I got a question about the scale of uh, how, how much examples this model needs to learn. I'm aware that you have like many models for a lot of different purposes and they may need different uh, number of learning examples to achieve the uh, uh, desired accuracy. But how many examples on average does do you need to have your, uh, to, be, to be sure of your predictions at the satisfactory level to have a good accuracy of the, of the model? So um, if it is strictly tied to the digital side of things only, like some sort of a conversion event, uh, because uh, most of the companies' websites typically have thousands of visitors, um, we end up uh, very easily reaching to a few hundred thousand um, observations or a few hundred thousand visitor level um, data points uh, very easily. Um, so just on the easier decisions that people are making, whether they're micro converting or not, or they're opening something uh, or adding something to the cart or not, all of those end up having a lot more data points. Um, when we reach much more closer to something like fraud, for instance, then the number of transactions or number of purchases people are making is already very little. And so, from that point onwards, if we also need to uh, differentiate between fraud and not fraud, that's when it ends up being a little more difficult uh, for us to gather a large amount of data point, I mean, a large amount of uh, observations per se. So um, anything, uh, what we have done is we kind of, um, either go with at least four or five month worth of data at that point to start with. And if that ends up being even 40,000, 50,000, um, but we have actually carved it out separately that, um, that allows us to be a little more confident. And I think one thing that I didn't really mention early on is uh, most of the times when people do their model learning and evaluation, um, they have their training data set, they would have a random split and then they would check if their model's performing better um, and then make a decision. We never do that. Even if it is a very simple model, what we always do is we also take a completely unseen period, like a completely random period in future uh, from that perspective um, and, and test our model on that at least for a couple of weeks or if it is like fraud then we would end up testing it on a month so um so as an example if you're building a fraud model for instance 
uh, we would, and let's say four months of data is enough for us to learn, then we would reserve two months that we will not even spend any time exploring early on. We will only do all of our exploration and modeling on four months worth of data and then pick our model and then for the remaining two, just apply that model and see if we think that that is giving us a, a better performance. Um, and um, what we've found is this method has been very helpful for us because in the digital journey, uh, not every feature has a good um, staying power. It's not general enough. And by kind of keeping a completely different time period and using that as one more evaluation benchmark, uh, we end up finding like we found cases where uh, there was one model that was very simple GBT and another model that was very complex but was giving us really good performance in training on unseen data, they ended up being very, very similar. And so we, we decided not to use the much more complex model and just use GBT because they were so close to each other that the complexity just wasn't worth it. Hope that answers your question. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah. From what I can see, there are no further questions um, in the chat anymore. Then I want to say thank you to everyone, but specifically to the two of you. I really enjoyed the presentation and the discussion afterwards. I think we touched on many different topics um, in the discussion. And I, I think, at least for me, um, things have gotten uh, much clearer. So thanks a lot for, for putting this together and coming here to, to talk about these things. I very much um, loved the discussion. Um, and we are going to, in the final, we are going to reconvene on the 3rd of, um, of March again um, with our next uh, meetup on yeah, sensitive data and implications in fin crime. So I'm um, really looking forward to that as well. Great. Thank you. Thanks everyone for staying back. Thanks everyone. Thank you all. Thank you. For the Thank, you. Thank you. Take care. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.